Hello everybody and welcome to episode 16 of Magic the Judging where we teach you to be a better judge. In this episode we're going to be focusing on the NTR, or it's the abbreviation for the Magic Tournament Rules. As the name suggests there are rules that apply in Magic Tournaments. Um, previous streams I've covered the comprehensive rules. That we're, These are the rules for exactly how the game works, like the nitty gritty of I cast this spell, he does this, with this enchantments in play, and I'm on this life, and this happened. Um, how does this all resolve? Or something like that. Um, so, yes, it's kind of the mechanics of how the game actually operates. But the fact is that the game that you play at the kitchen table and a game that you play in a tournament are identical within certain restric restrictions. No, that's not the word I'm going for. Uh, uh, to a certain point, the, the game that you play casually on the kitchen table and the game that you play in tournament is the same. Um, but the, uh, the, the the ethos of the tournament, the structure to the game, that's it. That's the, the structure, the kind of how we put a whole bunch of magic games together and stack them on top of each other and call that a tournament. Um means we have some additional constraints. Um, so it's good that uh, somewhere there is documented the uh, rules that we apply to tournaments. And here we go, it's, uh, it's the magic tournament rules, quite simply put. Um, I'm pasting a link to a PDF file in the chat if you're following along there. If, uh, if you're not following along live and you're watching the recording afterwards, um, then hello, hello to you. Um, it's uh, I can't blame you for not tuning in live, honestly, on a special uh, bank holiday day for the uh, Queen's Jubilee. Um, I hope you enjoy the episode anyway. Um, so if you Google for DCI Document Center, something like that, and uh, have a look for the Magic Tournament rules of the MTR, uh, the version I'm looking at says it was published... Oh, it says it was effective April 2nd um, this year. So that's cool. Don't think there's been a more recent update than that. Um, okay, brief introduction. The DCI is a worldwide organisation dedicated to organised play. That's the difference between kitchen table play and tournament play. Is It's organised. It's organised by people who just like want to get a whole bunch of people together. And personally, I believe magic to its best when you've got to, when the metagame exists. The metagame only exists if you've got lots of decks in a room. Um, you've got week to week play, that kind of thing. If I don't know if you've ever played magic like just against one other person and always against that one other person, you end up with this kind of weird cyclical thing where you improve their your deck, but not in a generic manner. You just improve your deck specifically to beat their deck and then they, they, they come along they come back at you and you go back at them and you end up in this kind of cyclical fashion. That's an interesting way to play magic. Sure, that's absolutely fine. But a far more enjoyable way to play Magic, in my estimation, is when you enter a tournament that's going to have 100 people there and you don't know what deck you're going to face. So you have to build your deck to be able to cope with other strategies. Love it. So, um, the DCIA, uh, as this document says, although that name is uh, slowly but surely falling out of fashion, um, it promotes, enforces and develops rules and policies using the goals and philosophies defined in this document document and in the IPG. Well, I haven't covered the IPG yet, I know that. Um, this is how we deal with infractions, things that go wrong at a competitive level. I covered last week the JAR, which is how we cover things that go wrong at a regular level, um, which is good enough if you're seeking to become a level one judge. Um, today, the only parts of the MTR I'm going to go through are the parts you need for being a level one judge. There's sections 2, 10, and Appendix B. B. I can't remember if you see a mirror image of me. Yeah, B. There we go. Um, oh God, ridiculous things I do on this stream. Um, so the purpose of this document is to provide the infrastructure that's used to run magic tournaments um, by defining all the rules that uh, must be obeyed in a DCI-sanctioned magic tournament. Uh, why is sanctioning important? Sanctioned tournaments are important because of planeswalker points, because of rating, because um, by playing sanctioned tournaments, this is how you can qualify for things like uh, GPs, the Pro Tour, etc. So they're kind of important. Um, all players are treated equally and they share responsibilities according to the realm of the tournament. Um, now, there's an important hierarchy of documents here. Information that's in the MTR 
might contradict the comprehensive rules. In that case, the MTR takes precedence because the rules of how we must play in tournaments are kind of more important than the rules that just define how generally you play the game. However, tournament fact sheets also exist for specific types of tournament, like, say, Grand Prix trials. You can, you can see a fact sheet that tells you, um, it might tell you how many rounds you must play or something like that. That will override anything that's in the MTR. The MTR is about generic sanctioned tournaments, but there's always a fact sheet that accompanies specific types of tournament um, that will expand on the general uh, sections that are that are in the MTR. Okay, so that intro aside, let's skip right through to section two, and let's talk about the things that we do in tournaments as Magic judges. So, the match structure. Um, I should say, uh, just a, a quick uh, preface before I actually dive into these details. You will know a lot of these details if you've ever been to a Magic tournament. Um, the thing is that the, the MTRs, is quite, it makes for quite dense reading. I hope I'm uh, doing you a bit of a service by speaking it out for you. It gives you a chance to just read at the, that slightly slowed down pace that lets you take it in. So um, think about tournaments you've been in, think how this has been applied, think about situations that actually make these rules make sense um, as we're going along and uh, hopefully they'll stick in your head a bit more easily. Okay, so the match structure. A magic match consists of a series of games that are played until one side has won an announced number. So right there, in the first line there, we've, we've got um, a, a, a definition of when a match is won. It's when a player has won a certain number of games. You might casually refer to a magic match as being best of three. It's not actually true. It's not a best of three, it's the first to two wins. This is important because a match, sorry, a game in Magic can be drawn. It can be drawn by like an earthquake. If I earthquake for 300 somehow, um, and I'm going to deal 300 damage to both players, and we're not both going to survive that, we both die to the state-based action check at the same time. I did it again, episode one, state-based actions. I plugged it, I think, in every single episode. Oh, I'm a legend or something. Um, we both die in the state-based action check. The game is a draw. So if I've won a game, and you've won a game, and we've drawn a game, what's the result of the match? The answer is, right at that moment, there is no result to the match. The match isn't over until somebody has won two games. So a win, a loss, and a draw doesn't end a match. Um, obviously, time limits play into this, and it, it might well be the case that you can't get to a fourth game anyway, because you know, you're playing under regular time limits. But you might be playing an untimed match. Um, you might be at the Pro Tour, where instead of being best of five, as a lot of people will call it, it's first to three wins. Um, it goes to two all, and you draw a game. Well, the Pro Tour finals, the, like the Pro Tour top eight, they're going to be untimed. You you have got all the time in the world. If we draw a draw and draw again, we'll play nine games if we need to, to have somebody win three of them. Uh, I'm not sure that's ever actually happened, though. Somebody, I need like a Pro Tour historian on hand or something for uh, for cool things like that. Okay. So, as I said, drawn games don't count towards his goal. Match continues for as long as you need until time ends for the round, in which case the winner of the match is a player who's won the most games at that point. If both players have equal game wins, the match is a draw. So, matches can be drawn. That's an acceptable result of a match. They can be won, they can be lost, they can be drawn. Um, there is an exception, which I believe we'll come to later, which is in a single elimination tournament, we have to eliminate a player. In order to eliminate a player, we can't have a drawn match. So there's uh, an end-of-game procedure for a single elimination uh, match that must um, end in a player being eliminated. So when we come to that, uh, you'll, you'll see. Um, the default number of games required for winning a match is two. So ordinarily, you're playing first to two. Um, there are very, very few exceptions to this, uh, uh, this happening. The tournament organiser may define single elimination final rounds to be played until one player has won at least three games. As I've said, we do that at the Pro Tour, but that's pretty much it. The choice must be announced before the tournament begins. And this is, again, this is the generic tournament rules here. Like, this is what you can do as a TO. But you can't just suddenly decide 
for your Pro Tour qualifier that you're going to play first to three in the finals or something like that, because the fact sheet doesn't tell you you can do that. So, yes, PTQs will follow a specific format. This, this proviso that the tournament organiser is allowed to change the format applies to generic sanctioned tournaments, not a specifically named like tournament type that has its own fact sheet. Match results, not individual game results, are reported to the DCI for inclusion in worldwide ratings and rankings. So this was slightly more important um, when ratings were based on um, um, bum, 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 when ratings were based on uh, when you had ELO ratings. Um, it was important to state that if you want to match two one or if you want to match two zero, it it doesn't matter. The important thing is that you won a match. Um, it's slightly less important now with Planeswalker points, but it's still true. Planeswalker points are based on the result of a match. If you won a match, you win three Planeswalker points times your multiplier. Um, it doesn't matter if you won that match 2-1 or 2-0, or indeed if it was a Pro Tour um, top eight and you, you won it 3-0. It doesn't matter how many games are in the match. It just matters that you won. Okay, that's match structure. That's how a match is defined in a tournament. Um, we have a play or draw rule to say who will go first uh, in a match. For the first game of a match, the winner of some random method chooses either to play first or to play second. Um, it has to be a random method, and it has to be acceptable to both players. Uh, a dice roll, a coin toss, these kind of things are, are normal. You have to choose whether you're going to play first or play second before you look at your hand. Having said that, if you actually don't, you haven't broken any rules, we just assume that you're going to play first. Um, the player who does play first skips the draw step of their first turn, and that's referred to as a play draw rule. Why do they skip the draw step of um, their first turn? It's meant to be um, a uh, handicap. Yes, it's meant to be a handicap for the fact that you go, you went first. Going first is obviously an advantage. Skipping a draw is obviously a disadvantage. So it becomes a, there's a bit of a balance in there of how good is going first compared to losing a card. And, well, I don't think it's 50-50 balanced. But interestingly, um, DLS, uh, you may have heard of, uh, David Lyford-Smith, a level 3 judge based in Reading at the moment, um, he, uh, he's done a, a bit of a, a data collection uh, project um, where he's analysed the win-loss results uh, over the WMCQ weekends. Um, and uh, he got everybody to circle which player went first. So he's going to have a look uh, uh, to see if there's a statistically significant correlation between going first and winning, at least across the WMCQ weekends in, in the UK. Um, after the second, uh, sorry, after the third WMCQ weekend, um, we'll see some of the results of that. I'm looking forward to it. Um, after each game in a match, the loser of that game decides whether to play first in the next game. So this, this is this kind of compensates you in a way. You've lost a game. Okay, let's see if you can win a game if you're going first. Something like that. Um, they may wait until after sideboarding to make a decision. This this gets asked a couple of times. Like uh, you, a player sideboarding and they're like, oh, I've got Goblin Guide here. I kind of want Goblin Guide in my deck if I'm going to be going first, and I kind of don't want him in my deck if I'm going second. So, ah, oh, it'd be really good if I knew whether I was going first or second when I'm sideboarding. Technically, you you don't. You don't know whether you're going first or second, um, unless you're the player to make the choice, of course, um, whilst you're sideboarding. You've got to do that in the dark, so what, so so to speak. Um, if a game is drawn then the player who decided to play or draw the last game chooses again. So, I win the dice roll, I say I'm going to go first, I kill us both with an earthquake for over 9,000, uh, I choose again. In certain Premier Tournament playoff matches, a different play-draw rule is used, and in these ones, the player that was ranked higher in the Swiss rounds chooses to play first or play second in the first game of the match, and then... Like normal, the loser of the previous game decides on the next one. Um, this may be used in other tournament uh, playoff matches. 
And if you're using that rule in a random tournament, then you must announce it prior to the start of the tournament. But the list of where list of tournaments where this new uh, play draw rule is being used has been expanded recently. So it's the Magic the Gathering Players Championship, uh, the World Magic Cup itself, World Magic Cup qualifiers, the Pro Tour, Pro Tour qualifiers, and Grand Prix. All of those tournament types will use this play draw rule um, in the top eight, which was suddenly important to me the other weekend as I was doing the WMCQ in Edinburgh, and I didn't realise that it applied until uh, I actually looked it up. So very grateful I had the MTR on me. Um, Grand Prix trials do not automatically use this play draw rule. I believe you are allowed to. Um, I don't think there's anything in the fact sheet that stops you doing it. You are allowed to do it at a Grand Prix trial if you want to, but if you do so, you must announce it before the start of the tournament. You can't just get to the top eight and go, yeah, sure, we're, we're going to use this rule now without telling everyone first. So that decides who's going to go first um, in any given match. What do we actually have to do to get a match started? So these things must be performed before a game begins. Is it, there's a there's a seven step um, seven step uh, procedure of what you have to do to start a game. And again, if you've ever played any tournament magic, you probably know this. First of all, after the first or subsequent game of a match. Um, and uh, not for games that are restarted. There's an interesting thing, a little shout out on the MTR to Khan Liberated here. You can exchange cards in your decks for cards in the sideboard. Then you shuffle your deck. And you can do this a lot. This It's explicitly called out here that you can sideboard a couple of cards, start shuffling, and then go, hmm, maybe not that one, and put that one in instead, and carry on shuffling. So you can go sideboard shuffle, sideboard shuffle, sideboard shuffle, do whatever you like, and then eventually present. Present your deck to your opponent for additional shuffling. You are supposed to present your sideboard at the same time. Nobody ever does. It doesn't happen. But you can, all, by all means, you can demand it as a, as a head judge if you'd like to. Um, and uh, there was certainly a, there was a, a nationals tournament a few years back. One of the, I think it must have been a, a Great British Nationals, um, where... Um, we did sideboard checks. Uh, we actually went round and go. We need to. We're going to check everyone's sideboard whilst we're playing. You present the sideboard to show that you have um, a fifteen-card sideboard. Mainly, there was a a, a well-known cheat um, at some point where you'd sit at your table, you with your sixty cards, and you'd be wearing like a jacket with with pockets either side, and there'd be fifteen cards in one pocket, and there'd be a different fifteen cards in the other pocket. So you play your, your first game out, and it's like, oh, I'm playing against Red Deck Wins. I think the sideboard in my left pocket would be really useful. And you fish it out, and you sideboard. So the reason why we make you present your sideboard, or we would like you to present it your sideboard, is just to go, here is my sideboard, here it is. This is the sideboard I decided I was going to play before I sat down to, to play against you. Um, it's also technically supposed to be presented so that if we do a deck check, we can pick it up and pick up your deck and your uh, sideboard at the same time. Deck checks are in a later part of the MTR, so I'll reiterate that when we get there. You're supposed to get to this point within three minutes. That's actually faster than you think. Um, a lot of players will spend like four minutes, five minutes doing the sideboard, doing the shuffle and presenting. Technically, they've committed slow play as soon as they breach the three-minute barrier. Um, it's quite tricky to catch, to be honest. Um, as a judge, like you see a, a match finish, and you're not really interested in that match anymore because there's all these other matches going on around you with people actually playing magic, and you judge what they're doing. But it doesn't take too much to go, oh, I've just seen a match finish, look up at the clock, okay, there's 38 minutes left on the round. If they haven't started by 35, then they've taken over three minutes. Wander around, do some stuff, look up at the clock, 35, 20 in seconds, go go back over to the match. Do they look like they're going to finish um, uh, shuffling yet? Go, I'm, you're going to need to present soon. Okay, cool, fine. Gets round, no slow play penalty. I, I, I'm personally of the opinion that if you think someone's going to breach a three minutes barrier, you should tell them before they get to the three minutes so they have a chance to present in time and not, not to receive a penalty. But uh, that might just be me. So the next 
four steps, like steps four through seven, must be performed in a timely manner, but there's no specific time limit for them. Um, after the first or subsequent game of the match, the relevant player must decide whether to play first or second at this point if he or she hasn't done already. And again, it's just reiterated here, if you don't choose before looking at your cards, then you have considered to choose to play first. Then you shuffle your opponent's decks. Then, so that's that's interesting. Sorry, I'll, I'll call that out because I actually missed that the first time I, I, I went through this. Step three is present your decks. Step four is choose whether you're going first. Step five is shuffle your opponent's decks. So the choice is actually defined. It's right there. Present, choose, shuffle. Um, and then each player draws seven cards. <laughs> it, it doesn't explicitly call out that you give your opponent their deck back. Um, that's quite polite. Um, rather than drawing seven cards off of their deck, that would be ridiculous. Um, each player draws seven cards. Optionally, they may be dealt face down onto the table. That happens a lot. People like to show hey, I'm drawing seven here, because if you do get it wrong, um, the penalties can be relatively harsh. We're uh, competitive, you're going to lose an extra card. So. And then each player in turn order decides whether to mulligan, and then the whole mulligan procedure starts. Mulligans are actually covered in the comprehensive rules, but I'll go over them here. You, you choose whether you're going to mulligan or not. Your opponent chooses whether you're going to mulligan or not. And then you both mulligan at the same time. You shuffle up and you draw one fewer card than you did uh, the last time. So because you started with seven, you draw six this time, make the mulligan choices again, shuffle up until you've got an opening hand that you're happy with. Um, once all players have completed their mulligans, the match is ready to begin. Um, all of this stuff I've described, all of this thing is called the pre-game procedure. It may be performed before the time for the match has officially begun. And I would suggest that you do this. I call it out to players a lot. Um, Especially if I'm doing something like um, I'm just double checking something in the pairings or something like that. All right, wait, hold, hold up. Don't want you to start the round yet. It's going to be a couple of minutes. What I'd like to do is remind players that you can get as far as resolving mulligans. Just don't actually start play. Pe players kind of intuitively understand what play means in, in that sense. It's like playing your first land, putting something into play, doing something. So, yeah. I'd like to remind players that they are perfectly within their rights to resolve all of their mulligans before the clock on the wall has even started. And if you do that, you actually legitimately get 50 minutes to play your match. You don't spend lots of them in the mulligan process, which is quite cool. Um, okay, we talked about match results earlier and how you get to them, but match results can happen in a, in a slightly less organic way. Players are allowed to concede, and players are allowed to intentionally draw. If a game or match isn't completed yet, that's an interesting point. When is a match completed? Give me your opinions in the chat. When is a match completed? If a game or match is not yet completed, players may concede or mutually agree to a draw in that game or match. Interesting point. You can ID a game. A match is considered complete once... The result slip is filled out. That's why result slips exist, essentially. Uh, you, you get a, a signed, I want to say legally binding, probably isn't legally binding, but it, it's a signed kind of legal version of events that says, yes, this was the result of this match. Um, and once it's signed, uh, that is the result of the match and the match is over. Can't change the result at that point. If match slips aren't being used, once a player's got up and left the table after the gameplay is finished, the match is considered to be over. So it's not when lethal damage has been dealt. Uh, it's not when you know a player hits 10 poison counters or whatever, when a player's actually dead. When the state-based actions have kicked in and gone, you're, you're dead. The match isn't over right then until they actually agree on the result. Um, up until that point, either player can concede or draw... Uh, Though, there's a couple of important caveats here. If I concede to you, and but I did win a game in that match, then I have to concede the game 2-1. The fact that I won a game is important and has to be recorded. Intentional draws apparently are always reported as 0-0-3. It seems irrelevant, but uh, it actually factors into tiebreak um, arithmetic, I believe. Um, you may not agree to concede or draw in exchange for any reward or incentive. That's bribery, and that will get you both disqualified. Um, if for any reason a player refuses to play, 
then it's assumed they concede. It's there we go. Um, I'm being asked in the chat. What if there's a dispute after the slip's handed in? It has happened where somebody's um, filled out a slip um, and they've handed it in and it's wrong. Um, if you make the mistake, or if you realise somehow that you've made a mistake, you can go to the scorekeeper and go, uh, I think something's wrong here. Now, if someone's actually adjusted the game score after you've signed it, then, well, shenanigans, we have a, a, an infraction called fraud for that, which will get you disqualified. Um, if it's a mistake and you catch it like before it's been entered, um, or before the round ends, you'll probably get the scorekeeper to change things for you. But they'll probably get the opponent to come over and verify, hang on a minute, something's wrong here. Like, um, but if you hand in a result slip that's wrong and it gets entered and the next round gets paired and then you notice that it's wrong and your result slip was actually like filled out incorrectly by you and you signed it, we're going to hold you to that version of events. If the slip says you lost, then you lost. Now, occasionally scorekeepers can make mistakes. Um, if your point total is incorrect, this is one reason why the point total is always printed out on the standings for you. Um, if your points total is incorrect and you have a bit of a dispute, you can go to the scorekeeper and go, hang on, my points total appears to be incorrect. This is what this is my match history. I won, I won, I lost, I lost. Um, this is where I should be. If they look through the paper record and find that actually they put the, the result in incorrectly, then they will definitely fix it for you. It's, it's a definitely a possible uh, thing to do. But if it was your mistake on the result slip, we won't be fixing that for you. It was your mistake. Um, okay, so yeah, concessions, IDs, they can all happen. Um, as promised, we have an end of match procedure. So we've, we've had the pre-game procedure, what you do before you get started playing, and we have an end of match procedure as well. The reason we have an end of match procedure is because tournament games are often, well, by often I mean pretty much always, timed. If a match time limit is reached before a win is determined, then the player whose turn it is finishes his or her turn and you play five additional turns. Um, this usually means that one player takes three and the other player takes two. Like We go, I finish my turn, and then we go one, two, three, four, five, and then end the match. Um, but this can be different because I might be able to take additional turns, I might be able to miracle a temporal mastery in there. It's certainly plausible that the same player can take all five of those turns. I've seen it done. There was a combo deck that used, um, I think it was Time Warp, and I think it's Save of the Moment was a free mana spell that gave you an extra turn, but no untap step in that turn. And yeah, they, they did that to take all five of the extra turns for themselves, the greedy so and so's. Um, so it's, it's five turns. It ordinarily means three to one and two to the other, but not necessarily. Team tournaments that feature multiple players playing together, such as Two Headed Giant, basically only Two Headed Giant, they only get three turns. Because two-headed giant turns take a long time, and three turns is enough, thank you very much. Why do we have five turns at all, is an interesting question. Um, basically, it's because that is long enough for the game to like, turn a corner, as it were. It's long enough for time to be called with one player winning, and then for the other player to win. And I'm told that was that's the key factor between why it's five turns, why we don't just stop straight away. Um, I believe it also um, kind of factors into how easy it is to stall or, or play slowly to give yourself a bit of an advantage with respect to the time limit. If you know there's going to be a whole five extra turns afterwards, it's less effective. Plus, if you're actually caught stalling, we're going to disqualify you. But yeah. If the game is still incomplete at the end of your additional turns, then the game's considered a draw. Um, I should point out that if there's a slow play penalty uh, being given, um, you would ordinarily assign two extra turns to that match, and this is where the extra turns happen. They happen in this end of match procedure. So if there's been a slow play warning at some point in the match, then instead of doing five additional turns, you'll do seven. Again, the reason it's seven and like not six um, is because you still want the same person to be finishing the match. You don't want to somehow rob them for a turn or like reward the, reward the slow player for playing slowly. Um, it almost goes without saying, but if a judge assigned if a judge has assigned a time extension because of a long ruling, because of a deck check or for whatever reason, then the end of match procedure doesn't begin until the end of the time extension. Again, that, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? The whole point of a time extension is it extends time so that you get your full 50 minutes um, in play. Um, in single elimination rounds, and I promise we'll get to this uh, part uh, 
been a while, matches may not end in a draw. So if all the players have got an equal number of game wins, then the player with the highest life total will win the current game. And I'll put, just to be more explicit about this, you still do the five additional turns. You still get to the point where, in a non-single elimination round, the match would be declared a draw, and then instead you go, no, wait, a draw isn't good enough. So if we're still playing, we still have an incomplete game, highest life total wins. If everyone's got the same life total, or worse, you're actually in between games, so that the match score is tied and the next game hasn't started yet, then the game continues with an additional state-based action. If a player does not have the highest life total, they lose the game. That means you can win a match by gaining life. It also means, uh, and the last time I played any single elimination uh, with time limits like this was a, a Grand Prix trial using the um, Scars of Mirrodin block, it also means it's a really bad time to be playing Infect, because giving your opponent nine poison counters doesn't do anything in terms of winning you the game. So, yes, ouch. Um, top, oh, we mentioned time extensions. Why do you get time extensions? If a judge pauses a match for more than a minute while the round clock is running, then they should extend the match time in order to give players that time back. If the match was interrupted in order to perform a deck check, they should also get another three minutes. That's a good reason for this. If you've ever performed a deck check, you know the easiest way to do to check a deck against a deck list is to sort it out completely. So if you're handing a player a deck back that's completely sorted, I would expect them, in fact, I would instruct them to take the full three minutes shuffling. They need to shuffle. We have made their deck entirely non-random, and they need to randomise it, so they need to use that time would put the three additional minutes onto the match so that they do have that time. They're not being penalised just because they had a deck check. Um, certain slow play penalties add turns rather than a time extension. As I said, the turns get added to the end of match additional turns. The time happens before then. There's an interesting discussion happening in the chat right now about what happens if someone says go to pass the turn at exactly the same time that someone goes, that's time on the round. Active player, finish your turn. You have five additional turns to complete the match, as you'll normally hear judges announce. Um, it's pretty much impossible for two things to happen simultaneously, actually. Taking a bit of a philosophical standpoint here, one of them happened first. Use your judgment. Um, if you really don't have a clue, just pick one. It, it doesn't matter so much. You'll probably go... You, you'll, you'll probably have a gut feeling as to whether it's um, uh, like which player should be on should have been on turn when uh, time was called. Um, let me just think this through. If time's called in my turn, then you get the first of the five, two, three, four, five, and you get the crucial fifth turn. So it's good for me to try to pass the turn. Hmm. So I'll probably try to argue that I pass the turn because it's good for me because I will get the fifth turn then. And ha knowing you have the last turn of the match is, is quite important because it gives you that possibility of like doing an alpha strike to see if you can win the game on that fifth turn with no fear of reprisal. Like, why don't you often attack into a board um, full of creatures? Or well, because they might have the fog. If they've got the fog, they'll kill you on the swing back next turn. But if you've got the last turn of the match, there is not going to be a next turn. That's quite an advantage. Um, so that actually explains why the number of extra turns is odd, because it's the advantage to pass the turn. You want to pass the turn. Um, so you want to keep that play going. There's no advantage. Like, if you've played Pass the Parcel at a kid's party, um, the advantage is to hold on to the parcel. You want to hold on to the parcel for as long as you can so that um, you can get the prize when the music stops. This is the opposite. It's actually it's an advantage to get rid of it. Move, move the parcel off, get rid of it, get rid of the turn. You don't want the turn, because you want the fifth turn. Um, bum, 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 bum. Where was I? Right, 2.7, deck registration. Then, players are required to register their decks and sideboards, if applicable, in competitive and professional RL tournaments. A head judge may require registration in regular rail tournaments, but I wouldn't suggest it, really. It, it's not that much fun. Um, it's there to curb cheating. Um, it's there for coverage reasons. It's there because people want to know what the top eight deck lists of a PTQ were. Um, it, it's there because you don't want people swapping their decks in between rounds. 
which is all stuff we don't care about at regular, and it's just a pain in the backside at regular. So I'd, I'd advise you not to. If you're that concerned of people cheating by swapping cards in and out of pools at a, a pre-release, then sure, register the pool or something, but I, I would... Well, you know whether your local players would appreciate the uh, stops cheating aspect of deck lists more than they hate the, oh god, I've got to fill out a deck list thing. So it's up to you. I would not do it personally. Players in individual limited tournaments that are using deck lists must refrain from communicating with or revealing hidden information to any players or spectators until after they hand in their deck lists. Now, in like a, so for a top eight, GP, top 8, uh, PTQ, well, we'll try to sequester the players so that the deck building happens well away from anybody. Um, in a pre-release, uh, I'm generally a little bit lax on this, um, I, I admit, but you know, they, we're talking here about limited tournaments that use deck listing, because I don't use the uh, deck list at pre-releases, like this doesn't matter. But in a PTQ, this is the only time really you, you really do have to demand silence from your players. There's no way to police this. You you can't stop players communicating, um, communicating like hidden information without them communicating like well, and also allowing them to communicate at all. I'll try that sentence again. It's impossible to police players' communication types if you're allowing them to communicate at all. It's impossible to go. And by the way, don't reveal any hidden information. So you really do need um, need silence for this bit. Registered deck lists record the original composition of each deck and sideboard. Once your deck list has been accepted by a TO, it may not be. Sorry, I said TO because uh, it's capitalized TO. Tournament official, uh, any tournament official, and then it may not be altered. So once you've handed it into a judge, you actually aren't supposed to be able to get it back and, and alter it. Um, Players have the right to request to see their deck list between matches and will honour it if logistically possible. But it's really awkward during the um, during the first round of a tournament because what we'll be doing, we'll be counting the deck lists. We haven't sorted them. They're not in alphabetical order yet. You're in a GP, there's 1,200 players, and you want me to find your one list out of this 1,200 sheets? That's going to be quite difficult to do. So ad admittedly, we can't do it all the time. But where we can, yeah, sure, we'll give you a deck list back. You can't remember what was in your sideboard, you need to de-sideboard, but you can't actually remember how. Yeah, we'll try to help you with that. Deck lists are not public information at all. They're not shared with other players during a tournament. With one exception, and that is in some multi-day professional REL tournaments, to offset any advantage one or more players may gain from outside publication of deck lists, which would have been done for development or media purposes. The head judge may elect to distribute copies of all the remaining players' deck lists at some point, and this usually happens during the single elimination playoff rounds. Basically, this is the Pro Tour rule. The Pro Tour's played Friday and Saturday. You get to the end of Saturday, we know who the top eight is. Everyone in the world wants to know what are the top eight playing. They're not playing till tomorrow, it's Saturday night, they're not playing till Sunday. But everyone in the world wants to know what are the top eight deck lists. So we publish them, we put them on the internet. How awkward would it be if we said, hey, yeah, if you've got access to the internet, you can look at your opponent's uh, deck list. But if you haven't got access to the internet, then unlucky Jim, you're not going to get a chance. That would suck. So we don't do that. We let you see your opponent's deck list. But we are talking professional rail tournaments here. This is not something you should typically do at your own tournaments. Deck checks, we've mentioned them when we were talking about... Um, uh, time extensions. Deck checks are one reason why uh, you would give a time extension. Why do we do deck checks at all? Uh, well, it's to curb cheating again. The whole reason we have deck lists is because we want to confirm that you're um, playing... So, we want to confirm that you're beginning every match with the same deck. But to actually confirm that, it's, it's no good to just have you write a deck list out. That doesn't mean anything by itself, unless there's a random chance of your deck being checked against the list to prove that it's correct. So, deck checks must be performed at all competitive professional REL tournaments, and the head judge has the option to perform deck checks at regular REL. Again, don't. Please, don't do deck checks at regular REL. We recommend that at least 10% of all decks be checked over the course of a tournament. So, let's, let's have a think about that. A 64-player tournament will typically run to three, four, five, six, six rounds. 
64 players, 6 rounds, 10% of 64 is, well, 6.4 decks. Let's say 7 decks. But we take the whole match, so let's say 8 decks. I'm checking 8 decks, I need to check 4 matches. It means in 4 of my 6 rounds, I need to do a deck check. It means in the first round, I don't need to do a deck check. I can be counting lists, just getting that job done. In the last round, I don't need to do a deck check. Typically, we don't because we um, we check for bribery at that point. That's when bribery and collusion happens the most. That's when you need judges on the floor to be listening to what players are talking about. So is it okay to just do one deck check per round for the other four rounds? Yeah, sure, because you'll check eight decks and that's 10% of the field. Excellent. Um, let's go up to 128 players. We're going to be playing seven rounds. 10% is going to be roughly 13 decks. You need 14 decks. So you need to make seven deck checks in your seven rounds. So you need to be checking more than one deck each round. If you can check two decks each round, then you'll get that. Excellent. Um, if a player's drawn an opening hand and potentially made mulligan decisions, that doesn't stop you making a deck check. It just means you've got to preserve the contents of the hand. Um, unless, of course, you actually issue a game loss as a result of the deck check, in which case it's a, it's a moot point that hand's gone. Players may not sideboard after a deck check, although they may continue to mulligan if they haven't finished uh, the process. So, um, sideboarding. Sideboarding after a deck check. Um, this actually applies whether a game loss was given or not, which is quite interesting, I believe. The, the idea is that you have to start every match with the same deck. And whilst I've, uh, whilst I've, um, if I've, if I've stopped you from kind of beginning the match by doing a deck check, and I found a problem, so there's actually been a game loss, but we haven't played any cards at all yet, then it's still kind of the beginning of the match. The match hasn't really begun at this point, and you are required to begin every match with the same deck configuration. So even though it's game two, because it's the first game you're actually playing, you are required to not sideboard at that point. The theory goes that you're not supposed to actually know what your opponent's playing anyway at that point. Um, this argument's a little moot in Pro Tour Top 8 with the deck list being shown, but anyway. Um, you're not supposed to know what your opponent's playing, so there's no. You, you're not supposed to be able to sideboard. You're supposed to play a game of every match with that uh, initial deck. Um, uh, appealing to the head judge. Oh yeah, appeals. Appeals are a thing. Um, I think uh, I think I've been asked some questions about this before, so it's nice to be able to uh, to cover this one officially. Appealing to the head judge. If a player disagrees with the judge's ruling, they may appeal to the head judge. I mean, that's it. That's that's the bottom line of it. If I'm a floor judge and I make a ruling, it doesn't matter if I'm I'm level three or if I'm level zero. It, it just completely uncertified. It doesn't matter. You have the right every time to appeal to the head judge, even if the head judge isn't like. Is the same level as me. It, head judge is level three, I'm level three, chop. Sure. You still get to appeal. You always get to appeal. You may not, however, appeal before the full ruling is made by the responding floor judge. You can't go judge and then have me come over to the table and have me start talking and then go, no, 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 you go away. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to appeal to the head judge. You need to actually let me make a rule. Under unusual circumstances, the head judge might appoint another judge as a, as a proxy in order to issue a second ruling. But even if you do so, you still have the right to appeal uh, back up to the head judge. So unusual circumstances, they might include, OK, you're in a PTQ that's far, far bigger than you thought it was going to be. So you've got 30% of the players are actually in a completely separate room and the head judge can't possibly be in both places at once. Or you might go, OK, you're going to be head judge for that room. You're going to be my proxy for that room. You're going to be my backup ruling for that room. But even if I'm doing that, they still have the right to appeal to the head judge. Now, sure, it might take me 10 minutes to get to the second room or something. It's unfortunate. We hope it doesn't happen too often, but it's an absolute right. You can never penalise a player for appealing. Um, a player can appeal a, a ruling even if they think it's correct. However, of course, if we're eating up time here, we should be giving time extensions to get our time back. Um, it's pretty much sacrosanct. Like it's just it's a right that the players have, and whilst there's potential for shadiness in the appeals process, um, we're just never going to take that away from players. I should also point out that no player is under any obligation to appeal a ruling. 
Um, so this happened, I think, in a World Championships once. Um, a player asked the judge um, how Evoke worked under a Trinisphere. And the judge in question made the wrong ruling. Um, but it benefited the player who asked the question. And so he went, oh, sure, if you say it works that way, I'm going to do that. Now, the opponent at that point could well have appealed and gone, hmm, I don't think it works that way, Let, let's appeal that. But because neither of them appealed, then the game carries on exactly as that judge said how it did. So, slightly bizarre circumstance, but it can happen, and there's absolutely nothing wrong, nothing wrong, with a player following a judge's instructions. Um, dropping. Dropping is a thing that happens. Wow, this is a big section. I would have thought dropping would be uh, quite a simple thing to do. Players choosing to drop from a tournament must inform the scorekeeper um, by the means provided for that tournament. That's interesting. Um, often there's a there's a judge who will have a, a, a list, a master list of everyone who's enrolled in the tournament to be able to tick them off and say, yeah, you've dropped, you've dropped. You'll also uh, you'll normally be asked to provide ID. Um, yes, I'm dropping from the tournament. Oh, who are you? I'm John Finkel. John Finkel's dropping from the tournament. That's me. Honest. No, we don't want you to drop other people, so normally ask for ID. Um, players wanting to drop after the scorekeeper's been paired for the next round, well, they'll still be paired, and they'll they'll drop, and they'll lose a match. This mattered more under the ELO ratings when losing lost you points. Under Planeswalker points, losing doesn't really matter so much, so, yeah, awkward, but never mind. Um, however, players that repeatedly drop from tournaments without telling the scorekeepers might well be the subject of penalties up to and including suspension. This is to stop you totally abusing the Planeswalker points thing and enrolling for six tournaments at once and just going, oh, hey, yeah, if my match is finished over here, then I'll go to that tournament, I'll play in that one. But I'm not going to tell them that I'm uh, on, I'm, pl I'm, I'm like multi-tabling, I'm just going to see if I can get away with it. If you drop from a tournament after a cut has been made, no one gets to advance through. So, like, you get into the top eight, and you, let, let's even say you win your top eight match, you're going to go to the top four, uh, but you can't play your uh, semi-final because you suddenly have to leave. Last train's going or something like that, you've got no choice, you've got to go. Um, you drop from the tournament, that's it. No one gets put back in your place. Even if you cut to top eight, you announce the top eight, and then someone drops. You don't push ninth place up, it just doesn't happen. Um, the opponent receives a bye for the round. Uh, a cut is considered to be min made for these purposes once the cut itself or pairings for the round following the cut have been posted or announced. Um, I'll be totally honest, I'm not entirely sure what happens if you announce top eight uh, where the top eight's a draft and a, a player drops at that point. Um, I'm pretty sure you, by the letter of this, you are supposed to do the draft with the seven players that are remaining. Players who have dropped may re-enter a tournament. Uh, it's at the discretion of the head judge. They can't re-enter if it requires a deck that they didn't draft. So if someone turns up late to day two of uh, an event and day two began with the draft and they weren't there for the draft, then they can't re-enter during the three rounds of play that that draft is going to cover. Um, and they also can't re-enter after a cut's been made. So if there's been a cut for day two, uh, you, you can't re-enter during day two. And also, you mustn't drop from a tournament in exchange for or being influenced by the offers of any rewards or incentives, because that's considered bribery, just like conceding for incentives. Can't be done. At limited tournaments, if you drop between the time between your a draft and uh, deck construction uh, and the beginning of the round, uh, you receive a match loss for that round. Like you, you do get paired for round one. You always get paired for round one uh, of a tournament. You always get paired for the round in which you were just building a deck for. Um, again, more important under ELO than it was than it is now for PWP. Losses just don't matter as much anymore. Okay, doing well here. Blitzing through uh, section two, liking it. I'm on two eleven now. Two eleven is taking notes. Players are allowed to take written notes during a match, and they may refer to those notes whilst the match is in progress. Um, you most often see this uh, turn one swamp dress. You reveal your hand. I get to write it down. Uh, Gitaxian probes probably the modern equivalent of that. Don't even need to play a swamp for that. Just pay too long. Um, however, at the beginning of the match, your note sheet must be empty. It must remain visible throughout the match, so any notes I'm taking, I can't keep them hidden from you. I've got to keep them there. Um, I do not have to explain or reveal any notes that I make to you. I just have to keep them uh, visible. I don't have to show them to you, but I'm not allowed to hide them either. 
Judges, however, may ask to see a player's notes and request that the player explain their notes. Players may not refer to other notes, including notes from previous matches during games. So you can't look at the, your opponent that you, you dressed last round and go, oh, yeah, what kind of cards does that deck play? Not allowed to do that. However, in between games, you are allowed to refer to a brief set of notes that were made before the match. You're not required to reveal them to your opponents, they're totally hidden. They must be removed from the play area before beginning the next game. So often this will be somebody will like fish out a piece of paper, look at it, it'll remind them how they want to sideboard for this match. They'll uh, do the sideboarding and then they'll shop, uh, fold up a piece of paper, put it back away in their pocket, and it's gone during the game. It's perfectly fine. However, excessive quantities of notes is probably going to fall under slow play. Like more than a sheet or two. Really, this is, this is all you're going to get. Players and spectators may not make notes whilst drafting with the exception of authorised press, who will do this for coverage reasons. So you're not allowed to stand behind somebody, record every card that they draft, and then go and tell your mates, look, this is what they drafted. Um, you, might, you may not reference outside notes whilst you are drafting, whilst you are registering a card pool, or whilst you are deck building. So, no, you don't get to copy a, copy a pick order down from Star City Games and have that pick order route beside you whilst you're drafting. Oh, I can't remember. What's, what's better in Avacyn Restored? Uh, the green, huge Soul Bond guy or the uh, Restoration Angel? Which, which one's better? What's higher in my pick order? Oh, that one. You don't get to do that. That knowledge has got to be in your head. It's down to skill testing. We want to test, the, the test your skill during a match. Uh, we don't mind you deciding in advance what your sideboarding plan is going to be and then using some notes to help you remember that. Uh, but we do want you to draft cards um, from, through, from your own skill. Players may refer to oracle text either electronically or in paper form at any time, but you must do so publicly and in a format which contains no other strategic information. If you want to view oracle text in private, you've got to ask a judge to do so. The reason you might want to do that, you might want to look at oracle text of a card that's in your hand. You don't want to reveal what the card is, so you want to go, you need to go, judge, I want to look at the oracle text of this. Is that okay? I'll just get my phone out, do it in the presence of a judge. It shows you're not looking at any strategic information. Job's done. Artistic modifications to cards that indirectly provide minor strategic information are acceptable, but the head judge is the final arbiter on what cards and notes are acceptable for a, any given tournament. Just as an example, um, I've seen a card, an, an, an altered um, meddling mage. Meddling mage says, name a card, and that card can't be played. Um, meddling mage, um, where they'd, they'd kind of drawn on a speech bubble onto the meddling mage, and it said pyroclasm. Now, that's indirectly minor strategic information, like the, the letter of this thing. It's perfectly fine to have a meddling mage altered in, in such a way. Um, it's not really a, a note saying, oh yes, I have to remember that I'm supposed to say pyroclasm. It's just a cool modification. That's all it is. I briefly mentioned electronic devices there, in that you may look at uh, electronic versions of Oracle text. But uh, let's be specific. 212, electronic devices. You can use electronic devices and you can do the following with them. You can keep track of life totals or other game-relevant information. Um, mana pools, storm count, poison counters, etc. You can take and review notes, as outlined previously. You can generate a random number when the game calls for one, and you can briefly answer personal calls that are not related to the game as long as your opponent is like, all right with that. Your phone goes off. Can I answer that? Yeah, sure, fine. You can do that. Briefly. Briefly. That's important. Players may not, however, use electronic devices to access outside strategic resources such as websites or forums or like anything along those lines, or to communicate with anybody in order to receive outside assistance. If you spend excessive time on any of these, you might be subject to slow play. Um, if you wish to view information privately on an electronic device, just like we mentioned with the, with the Oracle text, you must request permission from a, do a judge should to do so. The head judge of an event may put further restrictions or forbid entirely the use of electronic devices during matches, don't do it. it it's more, it'd be more of a pain than, than, than it's worth. Um, electronic devices, they're allowed. Just deal with it. It's, it's not too bad. And uh, I believe this one's a relatively new section to the MTR. 213, life totals. At the start of a match, each player must indicate how he or she will keep track of his or her life total. So 
you've actually got to have live total out at the start. If you're doing it pen and paper on the pad, which is the best way to do it, then do that. If you're doing it with dice, well, I hate that because if the table gets bumped, your dice gets bumped, you're going to have a problem. But at least go, yeah, this is my life total. Um, a shared method is acceptable as long as all players in the match have access to it. So it's perfectly fine if we're recording life totals on my iPhone, as long as I put the iPhone where both of us can use it. Um, it also must be visible to both players during the match. You must be able to see your opponent's record of life totals. Any change in life total should be accompanied by a verbal announcement by that player of the new life total. So I attack for two, I should say you're down to 14. I don't always do this. Players don't always do this. It doesn't always happen. It should happen and you are allowed to tell people to do it. We're not specifically going to penalise you for not doing it though. If you've been told specifically to do it and you refuse to do so, then we, you know, we, we're getting into the realms of unsporting conduct. If a player notices a discrepancy in a recorded or announced life total, and this is now why it's important that you announce every time, and it's important that you can see your opponent's recording of the life total. If you notice a discrepancy, you are expected to point it out as soon as you notice. If you don't do it, you could well be guilty of cheating fraud. Um, this so nearly happened. Um, we had uh, There was a dispute on life totals after a game had finished, um, a guy goes, oh, why didn't you equip the Rune Chanter's Pike and attack me? I thought it was lethal. You, you've got eight uh, instants in the graveyard, yeah? And he, he kind of puts the game back together and goes, yeah, I had eight. He's a 1-1. One, one. That's only nine. Nine's not good enough. You're at ten. He goes, no, I'm at nine. Oh, no. If, if I knew you were at nine, I could just equipped and, and killed you. That's a horrific mistake. Or is it a mistake? I mean, is it fraud? Did, did the other guy know that he was supposed to be at 9, but he had it recorded at 10, and it was like, oh, well, yeah, unlucky. You think I'm at one point life uh, higher? I'm just going to let you believe that. If I believed that was what happened, I would have to disqualify the player for, for fraud there. Um, I believe it was actually all innocent, so uh, I didn't. But it's, a, it's just an interesting example of exactly how things can go wrong. Okay, so that's section two of uh, the MTR covered. Um, please do fire away with any more questions if you have them uh, in the chat. Um, I'm going to bash on, um, I'm not quite at the hour mark yet. I'm going to do section 10 because it's very brief and it's, it's really just factual. Um, so participation minimums. Uh, for an event to be sanctioned by DCI, it must include eight players. Uh, for any team or two-headed giant tournaments, four teams must participate. That's easy to remember for 2HG because, two, because four two-headed giant teams is eight players anyway. Um, so it's always just at least eight players. The reason it's not just at least eight players is because if you're playing having three-player teams, if you're doing like team constructed or something, then eight players isn't going to be good enough. You actually need four teams. You, you need to have 12 players in that case. For a tournament to be sanctioned, um, team and two-headed giant tournaments must have a minimum of two rounds in them, and individual tournaments must have three rounds. Now, there is a recommended number of rounds for the number of players um, that gets higher the more players are in there, but you don't. That, they're just recommendations. You only have to meet the minimum required rounds, which is three for a, an individual tournament. So if something like an FNM, if you play Magic every Friday in a venue that closes at midnight... And you only have time to play three rounds, especially if you've got to like do a draft as well. You're doing like limited format. If you've only got time to play three rounds and 16 players show up, then well, as long as you compensate people fairly, as long as you give like equal prizes to the two players who finish undefeated or, or, or something, something along those lines, it's perfectly fine and allowable and sanctionable to have a tournament that just runs exactly three rounds. That's fine. Um, if, uh, if you didn't get enough players to show up to meet the um, requirements or you didn't play out enough rounds because something went completely wrong and you just didn't get three rounds done, then you have to report the tournament as didn't occur, as, as not occurring. Um, you should announce the total number of rounds before you actually begin the first round and once you've announced the number of rounds, you can't change them. You are allowed, and this is quite interesting, but I don't, I've never really heard of anyone doing it, you may announce a variable number of rounds. So you may say, um, if uh, well, it's a 20-player tournament, we're going to play five rounds unless after four rounds there's, an un there's only one undefeated player. If there's only one undefeated player after four rounds, we're going to can it then and they're the winner. 
I mean, this is particularly acceptable if um, you're doing a tournament that has a, a single first place prize or something, for, like a winner box tournament or something like that. If you you're allowed to put a variable round structure in place, as long as it's spelled out exactly under what circumstances you're going to play that fifth round. There's a recommended number of rounds for Swiss tournaments. It's in Appendix F of the MTR. It doesn't matter for level one. Level one test, which is not. Um, there are invitation only tournaments. They exist. Um, we, you know about them, like the Pro Tour is invitation only. Uh, for Premier events, the invitation list is defined in the Premier event invitation policy. There is an entire document dedicated to who gets invited. As a TO, randomly doing sanctioned tournaments, you are allowed to uh, have an invitation only tournament if you like. Um, I believe Star City Games do a, an invitational, which is fine. All you have to do, all you have to ensure is that you offer a sufficient number of qualifying tournaments in advance to ensure that all players have a chance to qualify. That's it. As long as you fairly do that, then, then you're good. And finally, for section 10 of the MTR, is a, a note on the pairing algorithm. It's actually, it's, it's really long, their explanation of this, so I'll paraphrase it for you. Essentially... In constructed, you um, your pairings once you get to the top eight are done so that the your reward for coming first is that you play the player who came eighth, first eighth, second will play seventh, third will play sixth, and fourth will play fifth. Right, that's how the top eight bracket goes. Additionally, however, the the brackets are so that um, if you well, let's apply that logic to the top four. If you have the top four, you want one to play four and two to play three. First place fourth, second play third. That's what you would do if you had a top four cut. So to make sure that happens in the bracket for top eight, then what you do is whilst you have first is going to play eighth, the winner of that match has to play the winner of the fourth v fifth match. That's because if, if everything goes according to seeding, the winner of first versus eighth will be the first place player, and the winner of fourth versus fifth will be the fourth place player, and what you'll end up with is one versus four in the top four. Um, similarly, uh, two versus seven plays uh, against three versus six, because that should result in two versus three happening. So yeah, remember the reasoning behind it, and you'll be able to piece it all together. You expect players one and two to meet in the final. So they mustn't meet in any other bracket. So you, will, if you can't have, that means you can't have one and two meet in the semi-final. They must be in different semi-finals. So three and four have to go with them. So, well, let's go, well, let's reward the first place guy. How do we reward him? We reward him by giving him the lowest place we can. So we put one versus four, we put two versus three. And then we send that back. So how do we do that on top eight? We do one versus eight, we do four versus five. We do two versus seven, we do three versus six. And that's how you do the top eight. For a constructed tournament. Um, if you're doing a limited tournament where you're going to do a draft, then you actually draft in random seats. But how you do the top eight, how you do the pairings of that draft, um, works like this. You don't like playing against people who sat near you in the draft. This is the overriding thing in a draft. You don't want to play against people who sat near you. So that's the overriding thing here. You will not play someone who sat next to you until the finals. At the first round, you play the person who sat as far away from you as you can. That's your opposite. So if I'm in seat one, I'm going to play seat five. Seats three and uh, seven are not next to either me or my first opponent. Okay. So if you, if you think about it this way, if I'm in seat one... I'm sitting next to seats two and eight. My opponent in seat five is sitting next to seats four and six. So the only two people left that neither of us were sat next to is seats three and seven. So that's who we play in the bracket. So one v five, the winner of that match will play the winner of three v seven. And similarly for the like the other cross, if you're doing. It's only possible to play the person who sat next to you in the final that way. Excellent.
that's the pairing algorithm sorted. And that's section 10 done. And I'm only just over one hour and five, so I will cover Appendix B as uh, it is, again, it, it, is, it is very much part of what you need to know to uh, pass the level one judge test. And Appendix B is just about time limits. So very briefly, you are required to allow 40 minutes per match for uh, a, a sanction tournament. You are recommended, however, to give 50 minutes to any constructed or limited um, match, 90 minutes to any quarterfinal or semi-final match uh, in a single elimination uh, playoff, and no time limit to a final match. However, they're recommended, the only requirement is that you play 40 minutes out. Additionally, for limited tournaments, it's recommended that you give 20 minutes for everyone to register a sealed deck, and then after the swap, 30 minutes to construct the deck. For draft, because the same player is going to be registering and constructing, we still only give them 30 minutes, but that's because it's a draft. Like, your deck's been half-built during the draft, surely. That's the idea. For team sealed deck, well... Deck registration still only takes 20 minutes before the swap. Why would that be any different to ordinary sealed deck? You're recording the same number of cards after all. But after the swap, when you're doing deck construction, because it's team and people are going to want to talk, they're going to need to talk, and they're going to take longer, we give them twice as long, we give them 60 minutes. So if for a team draft, we give them 40 minutes for deck construction and registration, and for two-headed giant draft, we give them 40 minutes for deck construction and registration, just a little bit longer. Um, there's nothing you can really do about this section here. You just, you've just got to get the numbers in your head. Seal deck, 20 minutes register, swap, 30 minutes construction. Draft, 30 minutes. Team sealed, 20 and 60. Team drafts, 40. Two headed giant drafts, 40. Look it up, try and just commit it into your head. I, I don't have a fancy way for you to do this, I'm afraid. If you're in the chat and you do, then uh, let us know. Finally, the head judge of the tournament is the final authority on time limits for a tournament. However, any deviation from these recommendations must be announced prior to and during tournament registration. So whilst people are signing up for a tournament, if you're going to be playing short rounds, you need to let them know before they um, pay their money. Magic Premier tournaments may have different time limits. Um, this often happens, and the Pro Tour often plays 55 minutes around. <coughs> 55 or 60 minutes around, depending on which part of the uh, tournament they're in. Um, it's often in the fact sheet or it will be announced by the head judge um, prior to the tournament. In timed rounds, you are supposed, you, you must in fact, wait for the officially tracked time to begin before starting your match. We said before you can go through the whole of the pre-game procedure up to and including resolving mulligans um, before, before worrying about anything. But you can't actually begin play until the clock on the wall starts. That 50 minutes is for play so you shouldn't start beforehand. Um, because it's part of Appendix B, I may as well bring your attention to the fact that booster draft timings do exist. Um, but I won't go over these in detail. One, because it's incredibly dry and boring. And two, because I don't think there is any point in trying to commit this uh, into your head. Um, you're not going to be asked this kind of thing on a, on a judge test, I, I'm pretty sure. So... There is a time allotted to every single pick from a booster draft, and it shrinks um, as there are fewer cards in the pack. It starts at 40 seconds, and it drops pretty much by 5 seconds per card, um, with a couple of exceptions. Right down to your, you're down to 5 seconds a pick for 4, 3, and 2 cards. Um, then you get a 30 second review after the first pack, you get a 45 second review after the second pack. There you go, that's that. There's timings for Rochester Draft as well, but that doesn't really happen anymore. There's timings for Two-Headed Giant Draft, which comes out two cards at a time. Um, you start at 50 seconds and pretty much cut by five seconds each time, five or ten seconds each time. Um, if you're interested, look them up. They're there in Appendix B of the Magic Tournament rules. It's far more important for these timings to just know that they are in the Appendix B of the MTR. That's where they are. So you know where you can look them up. That's far more important than actually trying to remember that in a 14-card booster, when there are eight cards left, um, there are 30 seconds on the pick for a two-headed giant draft. Like You're just not going to do that. If you ever get called upon to call a draft, 
which only really happens in competitive tournaments. It doesn't even really happen in Pro Tour qualifier top eights uh, much, from from what I gather. It really this only happens at things like nationals, um, which doesn't exist anymore because it's been replaced by the World Magic Cup that doesn't even use limited. So really, it's going to be a GP. It's only going to be GPs and, and Pro Tours where call drafts going to happen. If you're lucky enough to be asked to call a draft, you will have time to look up the timings in the MTR and uh, write down exactly what you're going to be saying. So, cool, yo. There we go. That's it. That is everything in an hour and ten minutes that you need to know about the Magic Tournament rules in order to pass the Level 1 Judge Test. I will give you a brief summary of things I have not covered. I didn't cover tournament fundamentals because, well, that's pretty simple. I didn't cover, pardon me, I didn't cover t um, some of the more esoteric uh, parts of uh, the tournament rules. So section three, which is to do with tiebreakers, to what cards are authorised, uh, sleeves, what constitutes marked cards, what constitutes hidden information, uh, what constitutes a sideboard, all those um, tournament rules. I haven't covered communication, which is a very big section of the, the MTR, uh, big in terms of important rather than like, actually large. I haven't covered tournament violations, um, such as unsporting conduct. I haven't covered in detail the rules for constructed tournaments and the rules for limited tournaments and the rules for team tournaments and the rules for two-headed giant tournaments. They're all in there, it's just they're not particularly needed for passing the level one judge test, that's why I haven't covered them today. But I will cover those, uh, let's just say I'll reserve those sections for future use, much like Appendix C. Sorry, a bit of a sad joke there. Um, Appendix C of the MTR is literally reserved for future use, and it just says reserved for future use, which I think is brilliant. Um, sorry, someone's picked up on something I just said in the chat. Um, Two-headed giant isn't uh, absent from the test. I think I, I just imply that two-headed giant rules aren't in the test. No, two-headed giant as it exists in the comprehensive rules, as in how you play the game, is in the test. The fact that in two-headed giant you play three turns after extra time uh, instead of five is part of what I just mentioned in um, in in part two, section two of the MTR. So that's there. But the two-headed giant tournament rules, like. How does the match structure work? What are the communication rules? How does the play draw world rule work? How does the pre-game procedure work? Um, how can I? How do I construct a two HG deck? How do I do a two HG booster draft? Those tournament rules of two HG, they're not in um, a level one judge test. Game rules: What happens when I uh, do I attack ahead? Do I attack the team? How do my opponents lose life? Um, what happens if I resolve a biorhythm, those kind of things. Yeah, sure, they turn up on the test. And I did a two-headed giant stream back on, I want to say episode four, um, one of my stream historians, historians will uh, probably be able to correct me if I'm wrong there. I'm pretty sure it was episode four-ish. Uh, I did a stream on two-headed giant. So if you want to cover two-headed giant comprehensive rules, go check it out. It's on YouTube. Uh, it's on Ustream. You can, you can find it. So, um, unless there's any more questions coming up in the chat, I'm not seeing any. Thank you for this uh, whistle-stop tour of the relevant sections of the MTR. Um, I think I'm going to stick with the MTR for next week. I'm going to try and tackle communication. If I can actually come up with some decent examples of that. And get away from this slightly dry format of pretty much just reading policy out. Um, I hope that uh, you guys have uh, managed to learn something this week. Um, I hope that I've kind of sparked your imagination a little bit or just maybe got you to actually sit down and read some policy because uh, I know it can be tough I know it can be dry and a little bit grueling uh, but just you know, having a friendly face to take you through it surely what more could you ask for see you guys all next week thanks again for watching bye bye for now